Hello. We're back. It's been a minute. Not to you guys, but to us, I guess. So, welcome to Relatively Weird, the podcast where a couple of cousins get together and talk about everything weird. I'm Kim. I'm Jilly. And uh, let's go jump into it. I was going to change it up and I (laughs) fucked it up. Sorry. Let's do it. Do the thing. Okay. So, today is a Jilly story. I'm going to tell you about the mystery of room 1046. Oh. It's a mystery. Interesting. We start off in Kansas City, Missouri in Jan- on January 2nd in 1935. Oh, okay. It kind of, the whole research part of this sort of felt like a murder, mis- like not real. It is real, but it felt like, and you are, <laughs> like... <laughs> Mr. I don't know, Beaumont or something. Um, Bo- I don't know, like something, something 1930s. Is- fancy old timey name. <laughs> Beauregard. <laughs> All right. So a man in his looks to be mid 20s walks into the hotel president. He has a scar on his left temple, a cauliflower ear, like maybe he's been a professional or semi-professional boxer, and he has no bags with him. Hmm. He gives the front desk the name Roland T. Owen and requests a room for one night, but it should be an interior room, so not a room that looks over the street at any point. Okay. That kind of confused me at first, because I was like, is there ever hotel rooms that don't look over something? But actually, they end up giving him room 1046 that is overlooks their courtyard rather than the street. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So I think it's like, okay. kind of like a square, like, donut mm-hmm. type situation. A square donut. <laughs> a square donut. <laughs> so bellhop Randolph Probes escorts him to room 1046, and Roland, while, he, while they're, like, going up the elevator, Roland comments that he came from the hotel Mulebeck. And that their $5 a night rate was too high for him. Agreed. (laughs) So $5 in 1935, I guess, is like equivalent to $100 a night, which still is not. That's great. $100 a night. Yeah. (laughs) Where would you like to stay, sir? Holy cow. All right. When the two enter the room, Roland takes from his pockets a brush, a comb, and some toothpaste. And he sets it in the bathroom. So that's pretty much all he has with him. Randolph, so Bellhop Randolph, gives Roland... There's a lot of R words in this, so (laughs) I'm going to try to... I know. I I was like, Randolph and Roland sound really close, so I'm trying to get... There's going to be a lot of characters in this that are going to come and go, and you're going to be like, who is that again? So I will try my best to give you their profession, I guess, (laughs) before I say their name. So he gives Roland the hotel room key, and this part's a little confusing, but he explains that the the door can only be locked from the outside with the key. So I I don't know if it's like a um, deadbolt type situation. Hmm. You know how you can't you can't turn you can turn the dead well actually, or like one of the or a chain or yeah. I was thinking that because I was like okay. You have to have some sort of way to lock your door if you're in the room. Right. But I think there's also a way to lock it where you need the key to do that. Okay. You can't just like, yeah, that wouldn't make sense otherwise. <laughs> All right. Anyway, this is important. It will be important later. So a little while later, the hotel maid, Mary Sopic, enters the room and spots Roland. And she's like, oh, my God, I'm so Sorry. I thought this room was vacant. There was a room, uh, woman who stayed here like last week. And Roland's like, yep, no problem. Mary notices that the shades of the room are drawn and that he's just sitting in the room with just a dim lamp lighting the room. <laughs> Kim has feelings totally about Totally normal. Her. That's fine. I mean, yeah. So it's not normal, right? It's not normal. Um, <laughs> Roland decides to leave the room, let Mary continue to clean and then he just asks her, please leave the room unlocked. When you're done, um, I'm expecting friends to visit soon. 
So at 4 p.m. that afternoon, Mary comes back to the room with clean towels and she sees Roland just laying on the bed, fully clothed in the dark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sometimes don't you feel like you need to do that? Uh, <laughs> just mm, shut off. Yeah. Yeah, but he also doesn't have any bags with him. He's just like, how come? Okay, it, I suppose if you're my husband. So my husband has, what do you call that? It's astigmatism. Mm. So he hates like overhead lights. He hates like bright. I hate that he hates that because when I walk into a room, I'm like, it's dark. I can't see anything. Oh, no. But perhaps some people. I don't know. I like to live in a cave. I hate this podcast it. studio is very dark. It right now. is, but I'm looking at a light. I'm sure. looking at some notes on my computer. Anyway, a note on his bedside table reads, "Dawn, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait." Dawn, D O N, D O N. Okay. Yep. The next morning, so January 3rd, Mary comes back once again to clean and finds the room locked from the outside. So she assumes, like, okay, no one's in it. I'm just going to go in and start cleaning. So she comes in again, and she sees Roland in the dark again, sitting upright on the bed. Which, at this point, I'm like, do you not... I suppose if you're a maid, are you like, knock, knock, hello? That's what I'm saying the whole time. What is he going like, yeah, come in. I'm laying down. It seems like he's not saying anything at all. So, my other question... So, wait, this is the time that she found the door locked from the outside? Yes. But he's in it? He's in it. Okay. Weird, right? Mm. You're so good. Well, unless he gave the key to somebody. Anyway, go ahead. But right. Exactly. So, the room phone rings, and Roland answers it. He says, No, Don, I don't want to eat. I'm not hungry. I just had breakfast. No, I'm not hungry. Holding the phone... Roland asks Mary if she's responsible for cleaning the entire floor, if the hotel is residential. I don't know if this is small talk or if he's trying to get certain types of information from her. She certainly doesn't know why he's asking. He again mentions that he was at the Mulebach Hotel and that the prices were too high. So maybe he's just like me and like small talk is weird. (laughs) Like you just kind of... I have three pieces of information I can talk to you about. (laughs) And once I run out of them, they're going to get repeated. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Maybe he's just socially awkward. I don't know. Sounds like it. So we're in, now we're in January 3rd, so it's the next day, and it's at 4 p.m. again. Mary comes back with fresh towels, and outside of the room, see, this is why it's it's just a coming and going type of situation. So outside of the room, she hears two men talking. She knocks and says she has fresh towels. And the deeper voice man answers, we don't need any. Except that Mary knows she hasn't put clean towels in there since, like, yesterday. However, when this... (laughs) So when I was researching this, I was like, so maybe he didn't, like, shower. I don't know. (laughs) He has no stuff. Like Right, right. Right, he's got no... I mean, he's got a brush, he's got... He has toothpaste. I don't know about a toothbrush, although they might have provided one, I I suppose. Maybe. Yeah. So it's 6 (laughs) p.m. So she... I think she just leaves. She doesn't give them any kind of towels or anything. At 6 p.m., Jean Owen, no relation to our Roland Owen, enters her neighboring room of 1048. So Jean will later claim that she heard loud conversations and swearing throughout the floor that night, not necessarily in the room. Okay. So fast forward to now we're at 11 p.m. A man named Robert Lane is driving on the street near the hotel, so basically outside of the hotel. He is flagged down by a man in an undershirt, pants, and shoes. So upon closer inspection, he also sees that the man has, like, a deep scratch down one arm. The guy in the undershirt apologizes to Robert, and he's like, I'm sorry, I mistook you for a taxi, but can you maybe bring me to a, you know, like, the nearest taxi station? Is that what they call it? Taxi station? (laughs) Depot? Or is that a bus depot? I don't know. (laughs) Wherever the nearest taxis are. (laughs) 
Robert the taxi stable. Yeah. <laughs> Robert agrees and tells him you look like you've been in it bad. The man replies that he will kill someone tomorrow. Get out my car, sir. <laughs> then <laughs> Robert takes this to mean that he will kill whoever did this to him. So he seems disheveled. He's got a scratch. It's also January in Kansas City. It must be yeah. cold as hell. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know. I feel like if you saw a disheveled person, they were like, oh, I thought you were a taxi. You're like, well, I'm not. Goodbye. <laughs> you thought wrong, friend. The 1930s was a different time, I guess. <laughs> So the so Robert drops this guy off at the nearest taxi station. So we are now so that was eleven PM. We're now looking at twelve AM. So this is January fourth, I believe. Elevator operator Charles Blocker. It's B O L C H E R, so it's either blotcher or blocker, but I think it's blocker. <laughs> B O L or B L O? No, I don't think it is. <laughs> Bullocker. <laughs> he encounters a woman visiting male guests in the hotel. Mm. So the assumption is that obviously she's a prostitute. I don't know if he like knows her, knows her, but I, th- I think he knows her now. <laughs> the assumption, <laughs> yeah. sir. Maybe she's just. Afraid. Well, I'll tell you, she goes to the 10th floor. To room 1026. Okay. She comes back to the elevator five minutes later. And she wonders aloud why her client wasn't in room 1046, she says. So remember, Roland's in Mm. 1046, but she goes to 1026. So we don't know if she's thinking about a different room. What's happening? How are you? So are you confused? (laughs) I'm just, I'm taking... The facts, yes, particularly facts that come from witnesses, mm-hmm. with a grain of salt. Yeah, yeah. Because I could imagine that if someone was like, "Hey, something happened in ten forty six last night," whoever heard her might misremember. Maybe she did say ten twenty six, but they were like ten forty six on their brain. Right. Oh, she's oh the prostitute because also, you know. People make assumptions about sex workers. Yeah. Yeah. Thinks she has something to do with whatever is about to happen. I don't even know what's about to happen. So well, so we talking. got a guy who said that he was going to stay for one night. He's now up to, I believe, oh, two. Right. He hasn't True. had nothing with him except for a series of combs and toothpaste. And he's had some guy visiting him who won't let him get clean towels, apparently. <laughs> Okay, so she says she can't find the guy in 1046. She wonders if his room is in 1024, since she could see a light through the transom window, which I had no idea what a transom window Mm. was, but it's one of those, you know, like at the top of a door or something, it's like a decorative Mm, window. Yep. She could see light on through that room, but I'm also like, yeah, some people are awake at that time it doesn't necessarily right. mean it's the or guy you leave or... a light on yeah even if you're not around i don't know <laughs> okay so 30 minutes later blocker the elevator operator <laughs> is summoned to the 10th floor again now just as an aside oh. do you know was it that hard to operate an elevator back in the day or because they had, didn't they have those, oh, maybe, maybe it was a little bit sooner so, than that. Like, you have that little, um, that door that you have to close. It's like a, it's right, like an like accordion kind two, of thing. two, two doors. Yeah. But see, I think that still exists today. But there's elevator operators? Like, get out of the elevator. You're making, you're like <laughs> taking up oh, room. a lift man. Is that um, like the same type of people that like stand in the bathroom and give you mints and towels and stuff i don't like that listen so they they were it was a skilled position according to wikipedia oh. uh manual elevators were often controlled by a large lever oh the elevator operator had to regulate the elevator speed which typically required a good sense of timing to consistently stop the elevator level with each floor hmm 
What, so you didn't have to, like, step so, up or right. whatever? Wow. Imagine leaving that to the general public. And you're starting at 12 a.m., so. Ugh. Can't trust people, man. So, yeah, I could, that's what an elevator operator okay. did. Thank you, Wikipedia. So he is summoned to the 10th floor again by the woman, and he takes her to the lobby. An hour after that, he is directed to take her to the 9th floor. She's a busy lady. I think tonight. this is just, yeah. So uh, th- these seem like they're not really important, but we don't know who she is. Obviously, something happens in, in 1046. So I'm right. Attempting to lay out a timeline of this important night. Yes. At 4.15 a.m., she finally leaves the hotel. And then at 4.30 a.m., a man from the ninth floor leaves the hotel and says he's going out for a walk because he can't sleep. Okay. (laughs) You got all that? So she... Okay. January 4th. So now we're, what, two days in? Mm Mm-hmm. The next day, switchboard operator Della Ferguson starts her shift at 7 a.m. She has a wake-up call request from room 1046, but a light on her, her switchboard indicates that the room in 10... No, that the phone in room 1046 <laughs> is off of... I said cradle. I hope that that's correct. I'm really not sure what type of phones. Well, it's like off the hook. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I feel like a hook is like for those like stand up ones. Yeah. But but I think that's for the Gen Alphas who may or may not be listening. Um, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> you just didn't hang a phone up. It would go off the hook and it would go like beep, beep, beep. Yeah. Well, it's also important that it is on like a bedside table. Yes. So it's probably on a cradle. Yeah. I would imagine. Mm, yeah. I'm getting bogged down by things that, you know. I keep envisioning a rotary phone, but I don't think they have them. Me too. I feel like, yeah. Yeah, because it wasn't the horn and, like, the... (gasps) Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, but that was earlier, right? (laughs) Pause. Doing a lot of gesturing. (laughs) I'm sorry. Um, I'm making Kim do... It's okay. That's what... So, in the 1930s, it is common to see rotary phones. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's what I pictured when I was um, doing the research for this. So, mm-hmm. it is off of its... Would you call that a cradle? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. All right. So, Bellhop Randolph, remember him from the first night? He's back yes. on shift that morning, and he agrees to go up to the room to let the occupant know that the phone's not hung up. When he gets there, a do not disturb sign is on the door. And Randolph knocks. A voice inside tells him to enter, but Randolph finds that the door is locked from the outside. And a voice calls out to Randolph again, and he's like, turn on the lights. And Randolph's like, I can't even get in, but... (laughs) Turn on the lights. Right. So Randolph yells through the door that the ringer's off the hook, and he leaves. He goes back to the switchboard operator, Della, and tells her that the occupant is probably drunk and to just wait another hour. So he doesn't necessarily know that it's the guy. It's Roland. I mean, it could be Mm. anybody. At 8.30 a.m., the light on the switchboard is still on, meaning the phone is still off the hook in room 1046. Another bellhop, Harold Pike, is sent up to the room this time. The do not disturb sign is still in the door, and the door is still locked from the outside. Harold uses his key to let himself in, and when he enters, he sees what we'll know as Roland lying naked on the hotel bed in the dark. The hallway light is on, so it shows that there are dark spots on the bed, and I don't know if he... I don't know what he thought about these dark spots. I don't know if he was like... This guy peed the bed. Like, you can't really, as we know that it's not, it's not going to be pee because this is, (laughs) this is the podcast we're talking to a podcast about a guy who wet the bed. (laughs) And we're done. (laughs) So not wanting to disturb the guy, he keeps the light off and he hangs the phone up and then he leaves. Oh, so he really just doesn't, he's like, 
He's like, the, the guy's, guy's probably drunk. Go. It's not my... Oh, okay. He leaves. 10.30 a.m. The light on the switchboard indicates that the phone is off the hook again. So... That's creepy. Yeah. So Randolph, the first bellhop, he knocks again. And the room is locked from the outside again. Randolph lets himself in and finds that Roland is on the floor on his knees and elbows. And that his head is bloody. (laughs) Yeah. What the hell? Randolph, okay. In my research, it says that Randolph hangs up the phone. Like, bro, I think we're past that. (laughs) (laughs) The switchboard lady's getting really irritated with this. I gotta handle it. He hangs up the phone and switches the light on to reveal that blood has <laughs> spattered the spattered or splattered both both the walls the main room itself and all over the bed and in the bathroom what the hell blood everywhere basically randolph runs to get the assistant manager and when the two come back they find that roland is now like blocking much of the door because he's like fallen over and they can't get in so Roland finally gets himself up. He lets the two men in. And they kind of sit Roland, like, on the edge of the bathtub. He has a cord around his neck, wrists and ankles. There's also bruising on his neck, probably, from the cord. And several stab wounds to his chest. And then along his skull is, like, a fracture. What the hell? Yeah. And he's up? He also has a scar down nope he has a it's not a scar yet it's a scratch down one arm (laughs) okay like the yeah like possibly the man who had asked for a taxi before when they asked who did this to him roland replies nobody and he claims that he has fallen in the tub and hit his head And I only laugh because I'm like, I don't, you've lost too much blood. Sorry. You have That's... holes in your chest. Yeah. Where did those come from? Also, you don't have any clean towels. No. So I don't think you were taking a shower. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Roland's rushed to the hospital. He falls into a coma. And then later on January 5th, he succumbs to his wounds and dies. Oh, no. Yep. So what do you, before I go on, what what is your first theory? Roland is a spy. Okay. And something went wrong. Maybe somebody found out he was a spy. I don't think that the woman, do we ever find out her name? I don't think so. I don't know. It didn't come up. So the escort. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say that I think like she was disguising herself that way, but mm. she stays in the hotel till like four something a.m. Yeah, and supposedly on the ninth floor and tenth though. However, mm. we don't know that she didn't take the stairs after. Do you know what I mean? Why do you think she would disguise herself? Like, do you think she's, like, another spy or something? Or, like, a spy for whom? I don't have any idea. Roland could be a spy for... This is the 30... I'm not going to act like I know. Maybe (laughs) (laughs) it's part of the mafia. I don't... So, I think he's... So, like, she just needed a way to get into the hotel. Maybe she... Without people questioning, like, do yeah. you have a room? Are you? Right. Yeah. So maybe she convinces a man to get her in there. Okay. And then she's like, oh, I know. I'm so confused. Where do I go? Yeah. And then sneaks on into this. This is, this is it. This well, is, I got it. Um, <laughs> solved it. Goes down to the ninth floor to throw them off. Right. So the bellhop. Nope. The elevator operator Mm -hmm. can go, well, I dropped her down to the ninth floor or wherever. Yeah. Where did she end up? The lobby? Yeah. She ends up at the lobby and then goes to the ninth floor. Okay. So the elevator operator can say, 
oh, I took her to the ninth floor. She wasn't anywhere. She wasn't on the tenth floor. So she gets the backstory that she's on the ninth floor, goes up the stairs to the tenth floor, Mm -hmm. goes back down to the ninth floor when she's done. Oh, like she never went up to the tenth floor Mm -hmm. after she went up to the ninth floor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's my theory. As of right now. Okay. So detectives examine the room, which is now a crime scene. It is determined that the blood splatter was from probably like 4 or 5 a.m. that morning. Mm-hmm. So you're you're pretty good. <laughs> you just see too much like true crime or something. I, I don't know. I don't um, have a life. <laughs> <laughs> it's just this. No personal belongings are present except for the tag of a necktie that Roland had worn. His combs are gone? Uh, yeah. I mean, they didn't either. They, I don't know. How strange. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So some of the hotel belongings are missing, though. So there's missing shampoo, missing soap, and actually some of the towels. <laughs> so I don't know. But also, did Mary, like, take the dirty towels and then she was just never able to give them new towels? I mean, that might be. Mary, that sounds like an inefficient way to housekeep a hotel. Well, they wouldn't let her in. Yeah, but if you take the dirty towels, you have the clean towels with you. Oh, true. Oh, yeah. That is true. I mean, unless she just wants to make extra work for herself. Okay. A glass in the sink is missing a piece. So I assume it is jagged. It does not specify. But a hairpin, a safety pin, an unsmoked cigarette, and a bottle of sulfuric acid are found. A bottle of diluted sulfuric acid. So I looked up sulfuric acid. Mm. And I'm like, would the lay person be able to get their hands on sulfuric acid? But I, I, I mean... I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of it's stuff also, in the 30s that I guess you could get that you can't get now. But what would be like the normal application? Like what? Just civilian? Yeah, I feel like it would. I don't know that you would. It's too abrasive to use as like a cleaning solution for just your everyday items. Although I suppose it's diluted. I don't know. Commonly used in household drain and toilet cleaners. Right, but if they were saying, like, it doesn't seem like it's the hotel's sulfuric acid. <laughs> maybe it was Mary, you know? Uh, maybe. Yeah, well, there's four fingerprints small enough to be a female's that were found on the phone's room. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> the room's phone. Four fingerprints small enough to be a female's were also found on the room's phone, not matching any of the hotel's workers Mm. or roland okay so witnesses so they found out that roland t owen is not a real name what (laughs) no some accounts came in that he was spotted with two women at several liquor store places between january 3rd and 4th so that was the night after he checked in or I guess, I don't it doesn't specify. I suppose it could be the day after he checked right. in to the next day. Employees at the Mühlebach, the Mühlebach, that's a hard, that's a hard thing to say. It's a weird name. Uh, hotel agreed that a man fitting his description did check in, but he gave the name Eugene K. Scott. And he also requested an interior room. Hmm. So he was there, just under a different name. Roland's picture was published in the paper, and no one claimed to know him at first. So we were in January. We're going to fast forward to March 3rd. So no one's popped up. We don't know who this guy is. The funeral home housing his body announced in the papers that the man would be given a burial at the city's potter's field, which Mm. is like basically unknown or poor people who couldn't afford graves. The funeral home receives a call not long after from a man who asks that the funeral be delayed. They can instead have a burial at the Memorial Park Cemetery. The man will send money. He also says this way he can be near his sister. The funeral director asks the caller 
why the man had been murdered, meaning Roland or whoever he is. The caller said that he and two women arranged a meeting with him to seek revenge. He said cheaters usually get what's coming to them and ended the call. <laughs> Thoughts? Feelings? Hmm. So two women, we've already said, we've already heard that somebody had seen supposedly this guy with two women at like some liquor stores. Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> Roland was cheating on his wife. She hired the escort to kill Roland. Good theory. Or they knew she was going to hire the he was going to hire the escort and somebody came in after, but then I think we would know that someone someone unidentified was in there. But I think it's her. Like his uh not former lover, I suppose, like a wife or someone. A wife. Yeah. yeah. Okay. On March 23rd, the funeral home receives an envelope of $25, which is so cute. Today, it's like 600 bucks. The local florist had been sent $5 to contribute 13 American Beauty roses with a card that read, Love Forever, Louise. Mm-hmm. Only the local p- police were in attendance at the funeral, but they did have some people kind of posing as, like, grave diggers just to kind of... Scout to make sure, like, yeah. okay, if anyone was going to come visit. The Kansas City Journal Post received a call from a woman informing them that the man was given a former funeral. When asked who she was, the woman replied, never mind, I know what I'm talking about, and ended the conversation with, he got into a jam. He got into a jam. I know, it's such a 1930s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of Amelia Earhart on um, Night at the Museum, too. Yeah. I was thinking... Um, Even Jimmy Jacked. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that, actually. <laughs> to a jam. Uh, a Ruby Ogletree calls into the Kansas City PD and tells them that the dead man looks a lot like her son, Artemis Ogletree. That is a name. Mm. According to Ruby, the family had not seen Artemis in person since he hitchhiked to California last year, which is like, imagine if you're just like, oh, Kim, how's your son doing these days? He hitchhiked (laughs) to California. I don't know. He could be dead. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he did write her letters while he was gone. She did tell the paper that the scar on his head was from when he was younger, from, like, a spilled grease situation. <laughs> so it's like, um, I'll, I'll have you post the pictures, but it is, like, a, a bald spot on the side of his head. Not a big one, but... So the fracture was not from the event, or was this an additional... I do believe the fracture was from the event, and I also don't know what side... Um, okay. He so remember so she's when just giving identifying yeah, yeah, information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So remember basically. when okay. he came in, he did have like a a scar on his yes, one of his temples. Okay. Yes. Curiously, Ruby received more letters from Artemis even after he was dead. These mm-hmm. were typed letters, and she knew that Artemis didn't know how to type. Which I read that and went, "What do you mean you don't know how to type?" Listen, it was a different... Even if you did it, like, two pointers. I mean, you know how to read, right? (laughs) Obviously, because you're writing letters, or had been writing letters. (laughs) She received one letter in May that said he was going to Europe from New York. So I I believe it was, like, a boat situation. Mm. Mm -hmm. In August, Ruby got a call from a person from Memphis, Tennessee telling her that Artemis saved his life in a fight, but that Artemis couldn't write her himself because he had lost one of his thumbs in the fight. I'm sorry. This is just we. This is so wild. It's just a really weird excuse, but also if the guy's calling her, then like Artemis could have called her too. Like he doesn't right. have to like You gave an excuse for him to not write, but yeah. not talk on is he standing there can i talk he claimed that artemis moved to cairo egypt (laughs) okay no man named artemis ogletree was ever recorded to have boarded any ship 
traveling to Egypt around that time, nor was there any record from the U.S. Embassy in Cairo Mm -hmm. that had an Artemis Ogletree, but that doesn't mean that he didn't give, like, a different name, although this was also after he, I mean, the body had been found, so. Yes. Police would later discover that a man fitting Artemis's description had also stayed at the St. Regis Hotel with another man. In 1937, NYPD arrested a man named Joseph Martin after he had killed a man he had shared a hotel room with. And he had shipped this murdered man's body to a, in a trunk to Memphis, Tennessee. What? <laughs> what the hell? Among Joseph's aliases, he also used Donald Kelso. So, oh. Don. Oh. It was found that Joe's handwriting looked similar to the one, the handwritten letters that Ruby had received, but he was never formally charged for Ogletree's death. I'm over it. Yeah. How can you? So, I mean, I guess they were just saying, like, well, his MO is this, mm. his alias is Don. I mean, in Memphis, Tennessee, it's so random, but weird. This is the last piece I have for you, actually. Oh, my God. In March 2004, John Harner. (laughs) Yep. So we're skipping basically a decades and decades. Okay. A historian for Kansas City Public Library got a call from an anonymous person who said they've been helping to inventory the belongings of an elderly person they cared for. This person had a shoebox full of newspaper clippings related to the case and a mysterious item the caller refused to identify. The caller and the elderly individual remains unknown. What? Yeah. <laughs> so, bef- I, I mean, that's so frustrating. That's right all now. we have. I'll tell you some very quick theories that people have about this. I mean, some people think like you did. He had like a broken engagement. He cheated on somebody. They either hired somebody or knew someone and killed him. The mafia, maybe mm. because of like the dawn or whatever. Mm-hmm. And some people think that the prostitute might have been mm. like a hire or something. But no one really knows. And it's also like, why are you trying to keep this man alive? Like seemingly to his family. Right. Even though it's already been published in the paper that, like, he's dead. I mean, she knows what he looks like. That's a, you you know, not many people have that type of scar. Well, and nobody knew he was in Kansas City. Like, you know what I mean? It would be one thing if... Right. If whoever did it was like, oh, frick, everybody knows he was in Kansas City. So now I have to make them think he left but nobody knew that right so it's not it it seems unnecessary it seems like you're being just taunting and i think so part of it kind of seemed like do you really think that his mom's gonna buy that Mm. he helped me out in a fight and he's great but he's also in cairo egypt now so you're never gonna see him again but like but it also seemed like these some people took care to you know let him be buried in like a normal cemetery and they you know they receive flowers for his funeral so here's the other thing do we ever find out who the louise is no okay okay and (laughs) and he's only been it seems like he's been gone from home like less than a year Mm, right she was basically like oh he took off hitchhiking to california and now the gentleman who murdered the guy in Joseph. Yes. Yeah. So Joseph, we got Joseph's galore <laughs> in these of, I know. stories. What was his relationship with these men? Uh with the people he killed? Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't okay. really go into that. That's kind of the frustrating part too is like I'm sure a lot of stuff has been lost at least to the public over time. Mm. I mean, technically, it's still an open case, but the killer is probably dead by now. Mm. I mean, but it's just weird that he uses, like, Donald Kelso, and, I mean, basically, the MO is the same. And and Memphis, Tennessee, like, why, you know, the caller from Memphis, Tennessee? I don't know. Like, I, 
it's all weird. Like, it's so jumbled. It's hard to kind of, like, stick to one story, obviously. And also, why didn't this guy go, it was so-and-so before you died, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Unless it was, you know, maybe if it was the mafia, they would have been like, don't rat on us or we're going to, you know, kill your family or something. True. Well, and I'm wondering, the only thing I can imagine is somebody is claiming to move him around a bunch because After he's dead they want i think that they want people to question that it really is Art. to like always have this question whether or not it's artemis yeah i just feel like if you're a mom you're gonna know what your kid looks like like yeah that's him you know i know I don't know. That's I don't very know either. Strange. But isn't it weird? Like all the way up to 2004, where more cryptic callers are like, hey, I'm taking care of someone who might have done it or knows who it is, but I'm not going to tell you. And there's also an item that's pretty. Like, what was the item? Was it to like. I not even want to say it on the phone. Yeah. It's weird. And that is so fresh. So. Like, why even do that? At why this point? did nothing ever happen with it? With the case? With the call about the person. So, like, they never found out who the caller was. They never identified themselves and said, No, you can but find they me. Were, at- they were calling the, um, his, it wasn't like they were calling the police. They were calling right. a historian. So he probably just, you know, answered his, his desk phone and was like, What? And then I the person know. hung up and he yeah, was like, Shoot. Like, didn't have. I, <laughs> I know you don't. I know you. I don't think you watch community but he's like trace the call Rhonda. <laughs> well 2004 you had star six nine yeah but you can also don't can't you can you used to be able to like star six eight yeah and, like block the phone number yeah yeah like i mean and also you're not expecting it you're a historian who's gonna call you about a a death from the 1930s i'm sorry as a historian that's probably the most exciting thing you probably but you wouldn't expect week. it you would have been like you know someone called i don't know looking for an overdue library a book document or i'm looking for documents yeah i don't know what do you think it's it's kind of frustrating because none of the clues make much sense but so it now that i know that Roland Artemis whatever uh was alive until he got to the hospital it makes a lot more sense now about the phone going back off the hook so here's the other thing too who kept locking him in so the (laughs) first time that somebody you know so uh I think it was Randolph he was the one that went up and he's like, oh, I'll let them know that the phone's off the hook. And when he couldn't get in, he was like, whatever. Hey, phone's off the hook. Mm. You can't get a call unless <laughs> you hang it up. And then it was hung up, but then it was off the hook again. Right. Like, was he like flailing around? True. The dark spots, I think we can all agree, were blood. Um, or like maybe he picked it up to try to call for help and then dropped it. But then he also didn't want help because he was like, no, no. But I mean, also though, you have head trauma. Maybe you're like, you, you know, like, I know, you're just out of your mind. I don't know. Like, what is the sulfuric acid for? Were you trying to dissolve somebody? Why didn't he have anything so with don't it? Dilute it. True. <laughs> <laughs> um. Now, did they ever, f- I feel like I'm going to get frustrated because nobody probably mentions this. Did they ever find the key that was his? Um, I don't, I, you, no I don't one mentions know. it. Okay. But that's a good point, though. Did did somebody, like, who the heck? And you want to be like, oh, my God, like, a, a camera in the hallway would have solved everything. Right. Well, some of it, anyway. Somebody must have just kept locking him in and then, you know, he was probably either like passed out or out of it or whatever when Harold went to go hang up the phone. And it's like, was somebody in there just waiting for Harold to like leave so that they could finish the job? Like, oh, <laughs> true. And I suppose, and he was naked, right? We sat on yeah. the bed. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that was it like the a bellhop and... was like just yeah, yeah. averting his eyes yeah. and didn't really. Yeah, okay. 
also at that point like you're really taking your job to the next level because i would have been like look we told you several times the phone you have to hang it up to get a wake-up call and if we can't get to you we can't give you the wake-up call like, <laughs> just like i think we're beyond wake-up calls here people uh, but it's also think about like you can't just go into somebody's hotel room because the phone is off the hook like it'd be one thing if you said yeah the guy i feel like this man's in danger but <laughs> you're also, inconveniencing the switchboard lady and she's really <laughs> annoyed about it well everybody has those people <laughs> at their work i don't have answers about anything but <laughs> neither, neither does anyone i'm just like you do. You think about it in the context of today. Mm -hmm. Nobody could ever get it. Because you have a record of key cards opening doors. Yep. In hotel rooms. There's cameras everywhere. You cameras have... in elevators. I, don't think, I think you have to put a card down these days too, right? Like it has to be a yeah. legitimate card. So they're going to have at least somebody's real name. Right. Phones. I mean, though, I guess they would have never even known. Because we don't have a phone situation like that. No. I don't know. That's just... I don't know either. It, the most frustrating thing to me, though, is like, dude, just... I mean, the only thing I can think of is like, maybe he thought, oh, no, other people will be in danger if I tell on whoever did this to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to die, but at least I'll protect them. Like, I don't know. I also, don't know. what the hell was he doing walking down the street? If that was him. Yeah that day like where were you off to i said it was at 11 p.m right yeah so and that was the night of the third or... that was yes the night of the third so the night before he was killed yeah so maybe he like and who so if there really was a man and he really was coming from the ninth floor the guy who said he couldn't sleep because i imagine they probably showed his picture to all of the workers. Mm. So if the elevator guy saw Roland's picture, he would have been like, oh, that's definitely the man from the ninth floor. But it seemed like it was, like, a different guy. Mm. So was it, like, he and the prostitute did something to him? Mm. Or... And what... I mean, why was the door consistently locked? Like, even after... You know, someone came up to check on him um, the next morning. Who kept locking the door? <laughs> like, who was it? I know, like, kept, yeah. But, right, if that man was involved, too, he's staying at the hotel. Yeah. So he could sneak on up the floor, up one floor. True, Just true. lock the door again. And how do you know, like, do you just have somebody constantly telling you, like, hey, no one's at the, like, go back and, mm. you know, like, how do you know the happenings unless you're just, like, staking it out? Right. Like, say you run up there and take a peek, see if anybody's found him yet. Yeah. Okay, or you're hiding in the, right. the room. Or you're in the room. Which is the worst. Ah! <laughs> yeah. And, see, I feel like Roland telling people more than once that he was staying at a different hotel, but then he came to this one. That seems like you're covering for something. Like yeah. you're, I don't know. I don't know. Throwing no somebody one... off, like, just to make a point of mentioning that. Well, like I said, either that or he's, like, real weird with <laughs> social interaction. Mm, could be. <laughs> and what about, like, you know, I don't know, is boxing a part of this whole thing? Like, people were saying he oh, was... Oh, I mean, the... Especially if you're talking about the mafia, yeah. talking about like they get because there's gambling. So anytime, mm -hmm. a lot of times when there's gambling involved, actually that was one of the theories that people were like maybe like a bet happened and mm -hmm. he was part of it or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> old timey, old timey mystery. Hmm. Yeah, that's irritating. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, you know, honestly. Kim and I were talking about the different topics that will be coming up, and I'm between you and me because we never know what topics mm. each one of us takes. I am trying to do because there's been at least probably by now a few unsolved cases yeah. that we'll have published. 
So I'm trying to like pick and choose. Like I can't do, I can't keep doing unsolved mysteries. <laughs> No, but they're but, they are they do strike you as like what the hell like what but it really is a mystery like what the heck happened in that room and why I mean he must have been scared about something that's oh, it was definitely hiding yeah but also he had people visiting him so people mm. did outside people knew where he not just the hotel workers but outside people knew where he was I mean that's like yeah like somebody's in hiding. Someone's helping you while you're in hiding, and then maybe, maybe they, they double cross you. Yeah. Or, yeah, yep. Yikes! That's definitely one that you just think, how? On, I mean, how could it possibly ever be solved? Yeah, yeah. Unless somebody, at this point, yeah. What's the likelihood anybody's still alive from then? Really n- minimal. They'd have to be babies. <laughs> I mean, the last the last person who talked about it was 2004, so maybe the caretaker of that elderly person who had, you know, all the newspaper clippings, they might still be alive, but mm. like, why are you, who are you protecting now? Like, is that like, why aren't you telling us what the, why even mention the item? Like, if you're not gonna, I then maybe just to have credibility, a like a stack of hotel towels. <laughs> unclean hotel <laughs> towels <laughs> and a tube of toothpaste oh well all right yeah that is a mystery tis indeed we did it Yay. <laughs> i'm so sorry you're gonna be like what the fuck <laughs> but we got practice. there the phone room okay bye out of practice <laughs> Thanks for listening to Relatively Weird. If you like what you hear, make sure to leave us a review and follow us on your podcast player of choice. You can also find us at Relatively Weird the Pod on Instagram. If you have any stories you'd like us to talk about, send us an email at relativelyweirdthepod at gmail.com. See you next week.